third semester. It, it is my great pleasure to introduce Wim Martens from the University of Bayreuth. Wim is working on data management databases in general and XML databases. And he's well known for his work on this and also for excellent talks. So I, I'm sure you will enjoy this talk. And Yes, thank you for not putting the pressure uh, on me. <laughs> uh, I am, uh, I'm of course very happy to be here and, and I'm of course very happy that, uh, that uh, I, I was asked to be here. Um, and it's actually always a pleasure to be in Warsaw because the, the, the group of colleagues that I know here, they are so nice and so smart that, that all the students here also should consider themselves lucky to, to be able to study at such a such a nice place. Eh? So, um, <clears throat> so today I will talk about uh, about graph data management. Uh, I come from a theory perspective, so uh, I will be talking about foundational aspects of graph data management. Okay, so. <clears throat> Let's first get you a bit warmed up into this topic. So let's tell you a little bit what this is about and, and yeah, let's try to get you a bit motivated for this topic in the beginning. After all, I guess you will be listening to me for a couple of hours in the next days. So a little bit of motivation will certainly uh, not hurt. Ah, and now also, about the, the, the talk in general. Uh, in the beginning of the talk, it will be rather, it will be rather non-technical. I will start slow, but in the end, I guess that there may be an increase of, of Greek letters and, uh, and mathematics, and, and there will be a non-trivial proof as well. Um, so in this way, um, I am trying to give people here, at least everyone here, a little bit of what they want to see, even though I do not know what you want to see. Yeah? So we will, just, we will just have to see what happens. And by the way, the end is tomorrow, not on Saturday, but it's tomorrow around 5.20 or something. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so motivation and what is this about? Yes, first of all, as I already warned you a little bit, this is about data management theory with uh, theory in bold. And what does this mean and what is theory for? Well, um, theory gives you a little bit, as you may already know, theory looks at idealized and cleaned up versions, perhaps, of real life. Yeah, it, it abstracts away a bit from real life and it tries to do so in an elegant manner, right? So the theory view of things is kind of organized, whereas in real life it may happen that, well, the situations that, that, that you see are more messy and, and dirtier, yeah, and yeah. So sometimes there is this discrepancy between theory and, and, and practice, right? Um, and also, yeah, but, but okay, but nevertheless, mm, when you make a system in practice, it is very useful to be aware of the theoretical underpinnings of, of your environment, right? If you build a system, it makes very much sense to be aware of the, the of the theoretical principles of your field, because otherwise the system that you're building, yeah, it may not work, okay? So graph databases, yeah, I will be talking about graph databases here. Um, yeah, what are graph databases? Yeah, you, let's just show you a picture. Okay, so this here, this here is a graph database. I am hoping that what you are seeing on this picture here is actually kind of self-explanatory. Um, what you're seeing here is, I hope, just information stored as a graph, yeah? So what, what you have here is you have a couple of artists, yeah? Maybe you have heard of people like this. Uh, 
and then citizenships and their occupation, and then here you have some kind of ontology which reason which allow you to reason about which kind of profession is subclass of which other kind of profession, if you would consider these things to be professions, I don't know. Um, and then, yeah, and, and so on and so forth. Yeah, so a graph database is, you can see it roughly, it just aims at storing information as a graph, and it is supposed to be a rather intuitive way of storing information as a graph. I don't have a mathematical definition of this, uh, of intuitive. I will not give one, but this is. So, so in the beginning of the talk, I will be telling you maybe a little bit more of, 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 of in the way that people in companies talk. Yeah? Sometimes maybe you'll hear a sales pitch or something like that, and then we will get to mathematical definitions later on, okay? Good. Okay, and now of course, if you have a whole bunch of information stored as a graph, only that, then this will of course be completely useless unless you also have a way to query this information, right? So, so what you also need is you need something, some mechanism that allows you to, well, get the information that you want to know from this huge data set. Yeah? And for this purpose, there are query languages, yeah? And this here, what, what you're looking at here, this is a concrete example of, of some query that if you would evaluate it on the graph that I have just shown you before, it would return to you the, the names of the United States artists who died of poisoning, yeah? And, okay. Now you may think, wait, this is so medieval poisoning, who does this nowadays? Well, if you maybe still remember the ontology from uh, the last slide, I mean, drug overdose is a special kind of poisoning and this still happens to artists, okay? Mm, okay, don't look at this too deeply right now because in the next slides uh, I want to explain you in an, uh, yeah, I, I want to explain to you what this thing more or less does and how it's evaluated on, on the graph. Yeah? Okay, so what you are looking at here, this is a query which is written in a language called Sparkle. That's, I think, how you pr pronounce it. And Sparkle is an abbreviation for, well, it's a recursive abbreviation. It abbreviates Sparkle protocol and RDF query language. So in this abbreviation, yeah, so you have Sparkle again, and you also have RDF, and RDF <laughs> abbreviates Resource Description Framework. If you've never heard of this, don't panic. So, but but now, now you have heard of this, and if at some point you want to impress other people with acronyms, these are two more acronyms that now you have heard of, okay? Fantastic. I, I, yes, good. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> so the query you have just uh, seen, yeah, the United States who died of poisoning. Um, I think if I want to explain what this query does, it's actually easier if you visualize it first, because what is this query looking for? Well, it's looking for some X in your graph. This X will be a node in your graph such that the occupation of X is something which is a subclass of artists, and then the citizenship of X is United States, and then the cause of death of X is something which is a subclass of poisoning, okay? So what are we seeing here in this graphical representation? Well, we have this uh, X with a circle around it. This is an output node. It means, it means that whenever you can match this in your graph, then, the node where you can match this here, this will be part of your output, okay? We have these nodes with stars. These are wildcard tests, yeah? For some of the nodes here in this pattern, I care about on which nodes I am matching this in the graph, and for some of the nodes in this pattern, I don't care about. So here, for this node, this thing, I can only match it against the node called artist in my graph, and here I don't care. 
good. What else do we have? We have these single edges here, and then we have these double edges. These single edges should be matched against single edges in your graph, and the double edges I can match against entire paths in my graph. And I desire here for this type of path that every edge on this path is labeled with subclass of, okay? Right, good. So if I have this query here and I have my graph as before here, we see that this query, if I try to match this against the graph, it actually works. It finds Jimi Hendrix, whose occupation is guitarist. There is this path to artist. Cause of death is some type of overdose, uh, which has a path to poisoning, and we have United States citizenship. Okay, so this is essentially what this query I showed to you does. Okay. So Fair. the double line meant that you can go along the path of subclass as long as you want? Like yes. The double line here meant, so if I, if I go back to the original query, um, what this double line here meant is this uh, subclass of star um, uh, expression in Sparkle, which means that you can match against paths of length zero or more, and all the edges need to be matched with subclass of. That's what this thing here concretely meant. Okay. Yeah, the query I have just shown to you, it was a tree-shaped query. This was pure coincidence, because if you write queries in, in, in Sparkle, you, I mean, you're not syntactically restricted uh, to tree shapes of, of, uh, in any way. So uh, you could just as well have written a query that translates to something like this. Yeah, and this would be something like uh, artists who live in the US, uh, sorry, whose residence is in the US, and who also have US citizenship. Yeah, and now you see that this thing has an undirected cycle. Yeah, so this can also happen. Okay? Right, and the things that, I'm, that I have told here until now, this is not just... Uh, theory in the sense that nobody in the real world cares about it. Uh, this, this kind of graphs that I've shown, th this graph that I've shown you and these queries that I've shown you, this actually works. If you would go here, yeah, query.wikidata.org, yeah, then you will be querying a much larger graph than the graph I have just shown you. Yeah, the, the, what I've shown you is actually a subgraph of the Wikidata, of the Wikidata graph. Um, and this Sparkle query that I have shown you, you can type it in here. You have to do it a little bit different still. You have to use strange numbers instead of subclass of. But then you can press run and the thing actually works. Yeah? So this, these are things that really exist in, in, in practice. And this Wikidata, for in, uh, the, um, uh, this is actually an example that I also personally like very much. I think this is a very interesting graph database. What it actually does or what it actually encodes is the following. It says, mm, look, what if we take uh, the, the, the entities of everything which is there on Wikipedia and then you model the links between these Wikipedia pages as edges, yeah, then this can give you an interesting graph structure, and this thing gives you a structured way of, uh, of querying that. Yeah? So um, you can query lots of knowledge here um, in this Wikidata query service. Okay, and if you're interested in where did I find this query with the artists who died of poisoning, well, what you can do is you can click examples here, and then you have a whole bunch of example queries to get started with. And then there is one query here which is called uh, politicians who died of cancer. And this is the one you can click. And I found the other query a bit more rock and roll, so I thought let's take artists who died of uh, poisoning instead of polit politicians who die of cancer. Uh, and yeah, then and there are many, many more queries you can uh, get started with here. And it's actually very, very nice to play with this. Okay, good. Mm, so <clears throat> these are graph databases. 
Uh, and I've given you an example of an RDF graph database. Why are they interesting? Well, nowadays, if you want to say that something is interesting, it seems that you have to mention the word intelligence and artificial in the correct order. Um, so graph databases play or, or uh, yeah, play an important role in artificial intelligence. For example, this computer IBM Watson that won this Jeopardy show almost a decade ago, uh, already internally had a, a graph database that was queried using Sparkle. At least my internet searches during the last week have told me this. Mm. So what else makes graph databases interesting perhaps? Well, they are becoming standard in industry. Uh, so companies like Oracle and Neo4j and TigerGraph, they are building graph databases and they are developing query languages for, for uh, graph databases. So this, they are really building these things. Okay. Mm. The best sales pitch I ever heard about graph databases was not invented by me, but from Hassan Chafi from, from, from Oracle. And his point was the following. Let's see if I can reproduce this because it was, it sounded quite convincing. He said, look, take, take in the back of your mind the biggest companies that you have now in Silicon Valley. Yeah? Okay, chances are that now you are thinking of Google and Facebook, okay? And now, you said, why did these two companies get to the top while other companies that were trying to do the same thing did not get to the top? Well, these two companies managed to understand very well how the data that they are working with, yeah, the data in their domain, they managed to understand very well how this data is connected. Yeah? Google had page rank, Facebook reasons about connectedness of people in social networks. Yeah? And yeah, whether this is coincidence or not, I don't know, but they did manage to do this very well and they managed to be at the top. Yeah? Now graph databases are tools that are especially designed to help you understand the connectedness of your data. Okay, so therefore, if you want to survive, <laughs> yeah, it's good that you understand the connectedness of your data and therefore you need a graph database. See, so you see why this is a good sales pitch. Yeah, uh, so this is a point about democratizing connectedness. It allows everybody to reason about the connectedness of their data. Yeah. Hmm. yeah, it was an interesting, interesting point of view. Right, for researchers, it's of course nice to have something that exists in real life and that also generates interesting uh, questions that you can think about, right? So graph databases are certainly a nice source of, uh, of research questions. Um, and currently, what is going on currently? Uh, currently, there is a query language for graphs uh, under development. So it's called GQL, the graph query language. And this language is currently going through an official um, ISO standardization process. And in databases, this is kind of a big deal because there was only one language before that went through the ISO standardization process, which was the language SQL. And I mean, if you ever had a database course, chances are, are very high that you have heard <laughs> of this language, okay? Yeah. Right, so that's going on right now. And another thing here, what is going on, uh, or yeah, about the process here, how this is going on, and this is something that I personally, of course, quite like, I have the impression that in this standardization process, or at least the years before the standardization, there is really industry and research talking to each other so that it is hopefully possible to make some well-informed design decisions. And I think this is a very nice uh, uh, um, side effect also of the research that 
academic people have been doing, yeah, and that industry, or at least some people in industry are seeing, oh, wait a minute, perhaps what these people from academia have been doing, maybe this was even useful, so let's, let's talk to them. Yeah, and this is, yeah, and this is of course very nice. Right. Oh, yeah, if you, yeah, that's true. If you would go to, um, there is a website for GQL, yeah, gqlstandards.org. You even can find an influence graph there and you see, yeah, uh, it's a complicated thing. Yeah, you have many players there. Uh, this is just a copy paste of the picture that's on the website there. Yeah, uh, you have Oracle, you have Cypher coming from Neo4j and so on and so forth. You have a whole bunch of uh, uh, things there, yeah. Yeah, what you always have in the standardization process is of course that you have people from different companies representing different interests and pushing for different features. You cannot avoid this, but at least here in the graph, you also see some, see, you have academia here. Yeah, so at least we, academia shows up on the picture. Here is also academia that shows up on the picture. So that's at least something nice. Yes. Does, uh, so the previous query language, the query was in Sparkle? Yes. It's a different type of query language because, um, because GQL is intended to be for property graphs. So not for RDF graphs, but for property graphs. So, uh, and I will be talking about the distinction between these two graph types uh, uh, in a minute or so. Yeah. So in this sense, it's a little bit different. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And the last thing, ah, and funny enough even, uh, here, Academia GXPath, this is even from a paper that I also worked in, which is why I was extremely happy that I saw this picture at some point, okay? Yeah. All right, so until now, I hope that I have kind of uh, aroused your appetite uh, for the problem, yeah. Um, there is a bit more meat to the story than what you can see here. This is coming later. Good. Yeah, this picture was meant to, to symbolize the word appetite, okay? <laughs> right, so what I'm going to do next is I'm going to talk to you about graph data models. This will still be, um, or at least I hope, very easy to follow. And then we will jump a little bit deeper into mathematics from here on. I will give you some background from standard uh, database theory and, and evaluating conjunctive queries. Um, and then we will go to specialized graph queries and then their evaluation problem and also their containment problem. So the containment problem, um, I don't know if this is a term that you have ever heard of or not. Uh, this is a type of problem that's relevant if you want to optimize queries. Okay. And once we have done this, this will be the biggest block. I have a couple of, uh, let's say, after remarks after the big blocks on, on graphs versus trees, and then data value comparisons. And then we will see how far we get, um, because once this is done, I still have a slide set which is supposed to explain some recent results on the current, well, research level. But I actually think that once we are through here, you can follow these talks and yeah, I can talk to you just uh, yeah, as I talk to colleagues in a conference. Yeah. Okay, so then we will try to do that and see what happens. Yeah. Right, so the graph, uh, the graph data model, okay. Mm, so, yeah, as already, uh, as was already uncovered by, by Shimon's question just now, there are different kinds of models for graph databases nowadays, and there are two big types of, of data models for graph databases. Um, the one is, yeah, it's called property graph, and then there are variations of that. Yeah, and then the other one is based on RDF. And RDF is what you have seen uh, uh, all the way in the beginning, this, this thing with the artists and the jobs, and this is RDF. 
or was meant to illustrate RDF because, yeah, right. And, I'm, and now I'm going to explain to you a little bit more detail about what is the philosophy of these two data models, what do they essentially look like. Okay, so the property graph data model, um, it models data kind of like this, and you already see that in order to to visualize a graph here, I, I, I already have to use different kinds of boxes. Yeah, so you see that this is, this looks like a fancier version uh, uh, of what I've shown you before. Okay, but what is the, um, yeah, what is the mathematics underlying this uh, this model? Well, more formally, what you're looking at here is, well, you have a set of node identifiers in. And actually, on this picture, you're not even seeing the node identifiers. So it could be, uh, so the nodes are this, and this, and this, and the identifiers could be one, two, three, okay? But I've made them invisible to not clutter the image too much. So you have a set of node identifiers. You have a set of edge identifiers. This is the same for the arrows here. Yeah. Mm. Then you have a function that maps the edge identifiers to node pairs. This is the function that tells you that this edge here goes from this node to this node, for example. Yeah. So that's the job of this function. Uh, and then you have a bunch of extra yeah, ingredients that people throw into the soup. Uh, you have labels set of labels L. What are the labels here? The labels are these things in these boxes with the rounded corners. So you have person, profession, uh, spouse, has profession. These are, these are labels, okay? And you see that a node and an edge, they can have labels assigned to them, yeah? And then you also have values. Values are, well, are this here. So Liz is a value and Taylor is a value, and this date here is a value, and this date is also a value. So these are the values. And then you have the properties. Properties are the things you see here. So first name is a property, last name is a property, from is a property, yeah. And, and now I think everything that you can see here uh, at least has been kind of explained. Um, so, when you have these labels, values, and properties, they connect to this thing as follows. Well, you have now a function from your nodes and from your edge identifiers to subsets of labels L. So to every node and to every edge, you can associate a set of labels L. Uh, yeah. Now, in this example, I have associated to every node and every edge just <coughs> one label, right? But in general, you can assign zero labels or multiple labels, right? And then the second function that you have, and this is the one that's uh, visualized by these squares. Um, this is a function from your node and your edge identifiers paired with properties. So this function maps a node or an edge identifier together with a property name uh, to values. Yeah? So this function would, for example, take here this node ID number two and then say, uh -huh, the first name property of this node is Liz. Okay, so that's what this function does. Okay, and this is kind of the philosophy of the, the property graph data model. And this is the underlying data model uh, that this company Neo4j is working with. Uh, I think there is even a book online called Graph Databases. And this is a book that is this big and it, uh, uh, it explains this property graph data model and how you query it and so on and so forth. So conceptually, from yes. your definition of that last function, yeah. every green, so for example, this green box with first name and last name is actually like two green. Um, well, all the green rectangles together are formalized by the same function. 
Yes. So I, I don't know very well how you intended this question. Well, first name and last name are actually defined by separate functions. Well, the function takes as parameters a node identifier and a property name. Yeah. So for this node, say that this is node number three, the function can take three comma first name, map that to Richard, and map three comma last name to Burton, right? So it's the same function. But of course, the function is mapping the first name property to Richard and the last name property to Burton. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay, does this clarify? Yeah. Right. Um, so, as I, as I said before, um, there is now this standardization process going on. And before the standardization process, people from industry and academia have been talking to each other. And what they did at the end of this process is they made a conference paper. Yeah? And this is, this is the conference paper. It's written by Angles and a whole bunch of other authors. It was published in Sigmod 1918. And this uh, paper defines the G-Core model and data model and query language. And this uh, is intended to serve as uh, a clean mathematical definition of the spirit of property graphs. And then, yeah, the standardization effort takes this as input. And then we will see what will happen to it. So that's the idea. Now, in this G-Core model, uh, there is actually even more than this here. Um, it, it, it also puts a big emphasis on um, sets of paths uh, in the graph. But I'm, I'm not talking about that here, because for the rest of the talk, this is not so important. OK, good. So that's that. So this is the property graph data model. Now, the RDF data model, this is much more much closer to just node and edge label directed graphs. It's a little bit different, and I will show you this in a minute, but it's, it's much closer. Yeah? So if you would have this here in the property graph model, in RDF, you would represent it like this. So it's, you would say, look, you just serialize this nodes and edges, and that's it. So here you see that the node identifier, I have made this explicit now. And chances are that this, if you would look in Wikidata, this is actually the identifier of Liz Taylor. I don't think I made it up. Well, it's, you, we can check this later. I am supposed to give you homework. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, but you have a node identifier, which I've written down explicitly here. And then, well, you can say this is a person. Yeah, and this is a way how, how you could also model this property uh, or this label here. Uh, first name is Liz, last name is Taylor, profession is actor. Okay, I have even okay, added some more information than, than, than what was here. Okay, and yeah, you can also start connecting data in this, in this type of model. Yes, so more formally, what you were looking at here in, uh, in the RDF data model is, well, it's actually just a set of triples. Uh, and the triples come from, well, different, uh, different sets. Uh, I, and then you have the set I and the set L, which are very important. Again, I am sweeping some things under the rug to keep it, uh, to keep it simple and to not overload uh, it too much. But essentially, you have triples from these two sets, where I is a set of internationalized resource identifiers. What does this mean? Well, this is a set of identifiers of things where people are supposed to agree on internationally which entities they represent. Yeah? So if I would take in Wikidata this entity here, then this entity should refer to this actress, Liz Taylor. That, that's, the, that's the plan. Okay, And then L is a set of uh, literals. So these are the constants. If you want to say, uh, that, for example, this person has an age of, I don't know, I guess, yeah. he's older than 50, but let's say 50, then this number 50 is just like a constant number that you would have in your database, and this would be a literal. Yeah? And what this 
restriction is telling you is that constants can only have incoming arrows. Yeah? So you should read this as uh, these are arrows, this is your starting node, this is the label of your edge, and then this is the place where the arrow is pointing to. Yeah? So for this arrow here, yeah, this one here would be this identifier, this thing would be profession, and then here you would have stage actor. Okay? Right, and then these triples, if you read papers, they are usually denoted with the letters SPO, and this stands for subject, predicate, object. So these are subject, predicate, object triples. Um, yeah, and this is how they encode data. Now, <clears throat> if you were, if you've already had a, a normal database course, you may be thinking, well, wait a minute, what you're telling me here is just a graphical representation of what we already know from relational databases. And this is completely true. Yeah? Well, I mean, this is just, this graph, this is just a bunch of binary relations. Yeah? For every edge type you have here, profession, for example, you can just make a binary table that encodes exactly the same information as what you have here in the graph. Yeah? So this thing says Liz, Liz Taylor is a stage actor, Liz Taylor is a film actor, yeah, that's this arrow, and so on and so forth. Okay? So uh, this type of graph you can also see as an ordinary database. Right, now there are um, special things that can also happen in the RDF data model, which is that, well, I told you in the last, uh, or two, two slides ago, that this profession, for example, this is an IRI, and that as a start of an arrow, I can have an IRI, which means that I could, in principle, also have arrows that start at label, uh, labels of edges, and in, R in, in, in RDF, this is also possible. Yeah? And if you look at, if you look at Wikidata, uh, I think you even find these arrows as well. Yeah? So profession is some type of property for items about people, and so you can have this as well. Okay, so this is kind of, yeah, as I said, I still swept a couple of things under the rug, but this is kind of what data models for graphs in practice looks like and I don't want to hide this from you. Uh, but today and tomorrow, we are just going to look at edge-labeled directed graphs. So we are going to look at information like this, yeah? just to keep it, to keep it simple. Mm, sometimes the theoretical problems we study on types of graphs are difficult enough, so we do not want to make them even more difficult by considering a complicated, uh, complicated data model. So for us, for today and for tomorrow, what is, a, what is a graph database? Well, so let's define it. It will be a very simple definition still. Mm, so throughout this entire talk, we will assume that sigma is a countably, countably infinite set of labels. These will be the edge labels that we use in our graph. And then a graph database over sigma, so a graph database with edge labels in sigma, this is just a pair, well, G, uh, this is, G is a pair VE, where V is a finite set of nodes, so we're only talking about finite graphs here, uh, and then E is a subset of, well, V times sigma times V, so this is a finite set of edges, and edges have labels in sigma. Okay, yeah, that's it for now. Yeah, maybe this is a good moment to take a, to take a short break. I think I've been talking for yeah, like 40 minutes, something like that. So uh, let's, let's do something like a five minute break right now and then I'll continue uh, after that. Okay. So let's continue. Very happy to see that there are still people here. Uh, so right now I am going to explain you some background from database theory. So this is an entire uh, research field that has been going on for a couple of decades. Uh, and needless to say, I cannot tell you everything what happened in this field. Um, but I will tell you a couple of, uh, I, I will tell you 
a couple of very basic things that uh, that happened in this field and that are that are going to be relevant for uh, uh, the topics that we will talk about in in graph structure data and in particular I will be talking a lot about so-called conjunctive queries all right um, we have had questions in the middle already anyway and I just want to encourage you uh, whenever you have questions uh, just uh, try to draw my attention and just ask them right away yeah so as you can see on the picture there are more convenient and less convenient moments in which you can inform people about the current status of yeah, the thing yeah? Mm, so yeah just ask right away yeah all right so now I will be talking to you a little bit about conjunctive queries uh, what are they and where do they come from and yeah what are some uh, important properties of conjunctive queries well continuing continuing in a similar spirit of this uh, uh, example that if already that you've already seen mm, let's con let's consider a very classical uh, database on professions and on citizenship and here I have tried to fake a hierarchy ontology into a relation yeah and now this is just a binary relation yeah, so now we have uh, what do we have here we have professions so we have names of people with their profession then we have like an is subclass of a hierarchy of professions so this this relation says that actor is an artist a singer is a musician and a singer is an artist and so on and so forth yeah so in reality this will be of course much longer and here we have citizenship information uh, so this has names of people which should correspond to names of people here uh, so Marilyn Monroe lives in the United States Jay Buchanan lives in the United States and the cinematic genius Tommy Wiseau is from Poland <clears throat> okay and if you have information like this um, well it seems to be rather natural to ask for things like well who are the artists who uh, are from the United States okay mm, so if you have paid attention in your uh, database course then you will probably come up with something like this that answers this question yeah so this is a standard SQL uh, expression that asks exactly this so let's have a quick look uh, in case that you have forgotten some details about your course um, uh, what what this does also I'm a theory person uh, I don't I, I write down here what I think SQL queries look like <laughs> it may or may not be real world uh, but yeah but I hope it will kind of work this one mm, so what does this query do you select the name from this relation P yeah or from here I'm seeing I'm going to get information from all the three relations where the profession from P equals whatever is in the subclass column of the hierarchy and then the superclass is artist so this is supposed to find names of artists and then with these names I want to have the second condition as well from the United States I will say look the name here should correspond with the name from the citizenship table and then the country in the citizenship table should be United States yeah so this query will find Marilyn Monroe for example because Marilyn Monroe is a singer and I can join singer here with artists that will be wait a minute that will be this equality yeah it's singer I can join singer here with singer here and then in this tuple the right hand side is artist okay and then <coughs> in the same fashion uh, I have this equality between Marilyn Monroe here and Marilyn Monroe here yeah and in this same tuple I have country United States this is essentially how to write this in SQL so you see that this is a very natural kind of query to ask in SQL and this type of query um, it only uses as boolean connective it only uses and yeah and a fancy name for and 
is a conjunction, and this is why this is called a conjunctive query. Yeah? It is these type of queries you can write with SQL, only using these equalities here and using AND. That's it. Okay. Now, theoreticians like to write this type of queries more in a fashion like this. Yeah, we think that this is a bit more uh, reason, re, re, readable. So we say, okay, select X where, and here we actually encode the, these e equalities that you have in real SQL queries. We encode this with, well, just copying variables. Yeah, so this means, look, whenever you can match this here in your data, you, if you match P, X, Y, now we want that you find a match with H where well, wherever, whatever, whichever value you matched y to reappears here. And then here on the right of h in the hierarchy, you have artist, and here then you have the same with United States. Yeah? So theoreticians understand this notation much quicker than this notation. Okay. The next slide, I'm just going to move this upward. Okay? For the rest, no magic happened. Um, all right. Mm. Yeah, and we try to make things as small and compact and intuitive as possible, maybe, uh, which may be the opposite of what people here think about theoreticians, but actually we try to make things more understandable. Mm. <clears throat> okay, so what, is, what does this type of notation mean? Well, we say, look, we, want, we are talking about some query Q here. X is supposed to be the output of the query. Um, and then this here is the body of the query. So this says what you are trying to match in your data. And once you have, once you were able to match this, then X is what you will return. Yeah? So that's another way of thinking about these queries. And now what, what else can you do to try to understand such queries a bit better? You can start visualizing their bodies. Yeah? So here, what you see here, what, what I've done is, well, instead of writing this query like this, I have just taken X, Y, and artist and United States as nodes in a graph, and then I'm, I'm making, yeah, I'm drawing circles around whatever belongs together in a single conjunct here. These single conjuncts here are also called atoms in conjunctive uh, queries. Yeah? And now what do you see with a visualization like this, or with a visualization like this, if you will, yeah? is that this structure that we have written down here in this body of the query, well, it doesn't have any cycles, for example. Yeah? Uh, if, so that's the advantage of representing these things like this. You immediately see it, that, this, that I'm not asking for, for a triangle shape in my data here, something like that. Yeah? Um, in the, talk here, I will be working mostly with this type of representation of conjunctive queries and this type of representation here, okay? Mm, right, let's see. Any questions about this? Right, so now I hope that you are uh, warmed up for the definition. <clears throat> so now we say that a conjunctive query over graphs, and I'm just going to abbreviate this with CQ, this is an expression of this form. It is Q, and then here I have a tuple of variables, and then equals, and then here you have the, the body of the query. This is the head, this is the body. Mm, yeah, and they, here we have these atoms that look like this. Yeah? So here, uh, all the Ys and all the Zs, these are variables. Uh, Mm, that's true. Oh, actually, they can be variables or constants in general. But in this talk, I will care mostly about variables, actually. Mm, and then here, I have um, yeah, the AI. These are just edge labels from your graph. OK? OK, and this is a conjunctive query. Mm, now, I am calling this a conjunctive query over graphs. And uh, if you have ever heard a database theory course, then you may have noticed that conjunctive queries in general in uh, uh, classical relational databases are defined a bit differently. Because um, here, 
I have these little edges in my conjunctive queries, and in an ordinary database, well, a relationship does not need to have two attributes, right? You can have more attributes, so you can write R, X, Y, Z, and then you get bigger edges, and then uh, these graph shapes of these things, they, they become hypergraphs, and yeah, um, and you get natural generalizations of this, but this generality is not needed for this talk, and for that reason, I'm just keeping it as simple as I can. And this is why I'm calling these things conjunctive queries over graphs instead of just conjunctive queries. Now, yeah, so whenever I say in the rest of the talk, <laughs> conjunctive query, I don't want to speak too long, uh, yeah. uh, I will mean conjunctive queries over graphs, I guess. Right, okay. Little bit of notation, by vars of Q, we denote the set of variables that appear in Q. So these, this is this set, actually. Yeah? Because whatever I mention here in X, uh, it all comes from the variables from the body. All right, so how do we evaluate these conjunctive queries? Let's uh, find artists from the United States with their occupation. So this is a, this is a, a query in this slightly more visual notation that does this. Yeah, I have a query Q. It will output X, Y. So I want to output the names of the artists together with the occupation. And then this is, this is the same body as the query that you've seen before. Mm, yeah. And this is one that will return the artist from the United States with their occupation. How do we see this? Well, let's look at the visualization of this query. I have drawn circles around the output edges. Yeah. So now how is the result of this query on this graph formally defined? I'm first going to show it to you with an animation and then I'm going to give you the formal definition. Um, so if you have this query, the output will be as follows and for the following reason. Well, this query can be matched into this graph like this, yeah? So I can match X to Marilyn Monroe. Uh, this has an outgoing PH to Y, yeah? And then Y has an outgoing HH to artist, and here I also have an outgoing CH to United States. This means that I can match this pattern here homomorphically in this graph such that X and Y are matched to Marilyn Monroe and actor, and this match of the query produces this output pair, all right? Now I can match this query in, in a different way as well. I can, yeah, match Y, I could match Y to singer just as well, and all the, all the co constraints of the query or all the conditions of the query are satisfied, which means that I can also output Marilyn Monroe singer here in the graph, right? Mm. Finally, what can I also do? I could move X to J. Buchanan, and then I get output J. Buchanan Singer. Yeah? And this is how this is supposed to work. Okay. Right. So, how do we make this formal? Well, if Q is a conjunctive query, um, then I say, aha, uh -huh, a homomorphism from Q to a graph database G is a mapping from the variables of Q to the vertices of your graph such that, well, whenever I have a condition like this in my query, this condition is mapped to something that satisfies the condition in my graph. Yeah? This means that mm, if I have this H, for example, Y1, A1, Z1, then H is supposed to map Y1 to some node and Z1 to some node such that in this image I have this A1H. So that's what this formally means, okay? All right, and once you have the notion of homomorphisms from queries to graphs, then you can define the answers of queries to graphs. I say, look, the answer of Q on graph G is the set I will denote it with Q of G. This is H of X x is the output tuple, such that h is a homomorphism from q to g. And this is intended to be formally precisely what you have seen on the example. Yeah? So I have used an abbreviated notation here. I am denoting, uh, uh, so this is a tuple, right? And I'm denoting with h of the entire tuple, I am denoting the tuple, well, 
h of first component of the tuple, h of second component to the tuple. So I'm just uh, doing the, 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 the natural generalization of homomorphisms to tuples. Okay? All right, that's the answer of the query on graphs. Now these were queries with output, and you may wonder, wait a minute, uh, Boolean queries are also important. Yeah? Sometimes we just want to ask in the graph, uh, I don't know, is there a five click? Yes or no? This is like, uh, this is connected to a famous computational problem, right? Um, uh, yeah, and then, then, the then the answer is just yes or no. How is this, how does this fit into this mathematical definition? Well, Boolean queries that answer yes or no actually um, are intended to look like this. You have Q and here an empty tuple of output variables uh, and then the body is just the same as, as before and then uh, the answer of Q on the graph will be this set if there exists a homomorphism from Q to the graph and it will be this set if there is no homomorphism from Q to the graph. So we have the difference here between the empty set or the singleton with the empty tuple. Now, if you read this as true and if you read this as false, this gives you the natural interpretation of Boolean queries, right? So if this body says five click and it returns this, then, yeah, then it means that your graph has a five click somewhere. And if it returns this, it means that your graph will not have a five click somewhere. Okay? So this is how Boolean query answering fits together with this definition. Okay. Right. So now, a couple of words about evaluating conjunctive queries. So, yeah, this is, of course, the most important problem of databases, right? You have a whole bunch of data. You have a query. Yeah. You want, when you press the red button, yeah, <laughs> you want to get the answer of your query in your database. Yeah? This is what users want. All right, so let's turn this problem in some kind of mathematical problem that, that people can look at. So the decision problem that I am modeling this as uh, is defined as follows. Let's take as input graph database G, so the entire database. You have a conjunctive query Q uh, with some output maybe, and then you have a tuple U of nodes of G. Yeah. And what we just want to do here with this decision problem is to test if this tuple is an answer of the query. Okay? So this is easier than computing the entire answer, of course, yeah? because if you can compute the entire answer efficiently, you can just test if U is part of that. Yeah? Mm. Yeah, but it's obviously a decision problem that's closely related to answering queries on databases. All right, so that's the decision problem. So what can we say about the complexity of this decision problem? Well, maybe not completely surprisingly, I have already mentioned clicks, for example. Mm, I'm going to talk about something else in a minute, but um, evaluating conjunctive queries is an NP-complete problem, right? So why is this? Well, let's give you a proof with some pictures. I actually, yeah, this, uh, re reduction from clicks is maybe not so exciting. I want to show to you another re reduction, which I also like very much, which is from three-colorability. Three All right, so what is three-colorability? It's a famous NP-complete problem. You're given an undirected graph like this, and your question is, uh, can I color the nodes of this graph with three different colors so that adjacent nodes always have different colors? All right, okay, what does this have to do with query evaluation? Well, let's take an intermediate step. Mm, let's take this graph and let's take this triangle. This is a triangle, uh, I hope this is visible. This node is red, this one is yellow, this one is blue, so we have three different colors. Mm, and a couple of slides ago, we were also talking about homomorphisms and three colorability and these two graphs and homomorphisms, this has something to do with each other. And what is this? Well, this graph G is three colorable if and only if there is a homomorphism from this graph to the triangle. What does it mean? And what was homomorphism here again? What did this condition mean? Well, homo homomorphism from this graph to, to this triangle means, well, there is a mapping from the nodes of this graph 
to the nodes of this triangle such that whenever I have an edge here between two nodes, this edge must also exist in the image. Yeah? Okay, so let's, let's just consider an arbitrary three coloring that satisfies the three coloring constraint on this graph. Well, if we would have this three coloring, I can immediately get a homomorphism from this three coloring. I just map the nodes here to the corresponding color here, yes? So if this graph is three colorable, then there exists a homomorphism from G to the triangle. And the other way around, if there exists a homomorphism from G to this triangle, well, then this homomorphism also gives me the three colors, yeah? as you see in exactly the same picture. Yeah? So this means that this graph here is three colorable if and only if there exists a homomorphism from this graph G to the triangle. All right, what does this have to do with databases? Well, and with conjunctive queries? Well, um, if I now take my graph that I had from the three coloring problem and I turn it into a Boolean query, so now I'm, see, now I'm using this graph visualization of conjunctive queries, yeah, and I'm just making it Boolean, so this is, this is a pattern I am looking for. I give arbitrary, I can give arbitrary directions to the edges, so there is no system in this, I just chose arrows arbitrary. Mm, yeah, then this original graph will be three colorable if and only if, well, the evaluation of this query on this database, I did make this bidirectional, returns true. Okay, and this is an encoding of the three colorability question into the evaluation problem of uh, conjunctive queries, right? So yeah, evaluation of conjunctive queries is at least as difficult as uh, three colorability. Ah, why is the problem in NP? Okay, the NP upper bound is actually the trivial algorithm that can just guess the correct matching and test if your tuple that you're looking for is produced by the matching you just guessed. Okay. All right, very interesting. So conjunctive query evaluation is NP complete. Now, at this point, you may be scratching your head and saying, but wait a minute. Yes, wait a minute. Uh, on the one hand, evaluating even the simplest queries, so the conjunctive queries, is an NP-complete problem. On the other hand, databases exist, have been existing for a while, and yeah, they seem to work, right? So the natural question is what's going on here, right? So let's spend a couple of words talking about what is, what is going on here. So how can this problem be NP-complete and things still work in practice? Okay, um, well, in the reduction that you have just seen, we have a database, right? The database looked like this. This is the database. If you look at this as the ordinary, in ordinary table view, we have an edge relation. This, it has six tuples. The database has six tuples. And then you had your query, uh, yeah, which came from the three colorability problem, which means it is so big, it eclipses everything else, yeah? You have a small database and a huge query in this reduction, right? And of course, this is not really what databases are like in practice, right? In practice, it is your database that has billions of tuples and your query is not so large, right? So in data management, queries and data, they play very different roles, yeah? So yeah, data is large. If you look for pictures on the internet for data and data storage, you find these things and you did this server like uh, storage racks and whatever, yeah? So this is data and your query, well, I don't know if you have ever seen this in your, in your life, this is the real thing which happened before the save file icon was uh, invented. Uh, when I played games uh, during my high school days, I had to store them on here. This is 
1,44 megabytes and a query of 1,44 megabytes is actually a huge query. Yeah? So queries are still not large enough to fill the storage that we had, I don't know, 30 years ago, right? So data is very large and queries are very small. If you want to be convinced of that, you can try in Sparkle typing a query and see how long you have to type before you reach 1.44 megabytes. This takes a while. Yeah, and then you understand why queries are small. Um, of course, sometimes queries are also automatically generated by programs. Yeah, this happens. And these type of queries can be very complicated and very large. Yeah? But at least they give you an idea of why this stuff is large and this stuff is small. OK. <clears throat> so, mm, yeah, how can we use this to try to give a more a, or maybe a better theoretical explanation of why things work in practice, right? Mm, so we have been looking right now at the query evaluation problem like this. So the input is the graph database, the query, and then a tuple of nodes. Yeah? And then I want to ask, ask if this tuple is an answer. Right. Mm, in this formal view on the problem, both the data and the query are part of the input of the decision problem. Now, you could argue, hmm, wait a minute, since the query is actually so small, hmm, what would happen to the complexity of this problem if I would just say that the query is completely fixed? It is no longer part of the input. Yeah? This actually gives you a bunch of different decision problems because now every different query is going to give you a different decision problem. Yeah? Mm, and this different decision problem is evaluation for some query Q. The input of this decision problem is just the graph database and just a tuple. And then you answer the same question. Is this tuple an answer of this query to the database? Right? Um, and in this problem, the data and the query were part of the input. And this in the literature is called the combined complexity of the problem because you have the combination of the data and the query and the input. And this here, the query is no longer part of the input. It's just constant. And only the data is part of the input. And in the literature, this is called the data complexity of the query answering problem. All right. So we could take this view on the problem and see what comes out complexity-wise. OK, let's have a look at that. First, maybe it's good to say what a complexity statement in terms of data complexity may mean. Because for example, if I'm going to tell you in a minute, the data complexity of query answering is NP complete, then maybe this is not clear at first what this means, right? So, so, so what does this mean? Okay, so query evaluation under data complexity is actually a set of problems, as I said. Yeah? For every different query, you have a separate problem, right? Yeah. So, yeah, every query Q defines a different problem. You could call this Q evaluation. So what about complexity? So if you would make a statement that says query evaluation under data complexity is NP complete, this would mean the following. Uh, well, for every query Q, the Q evaluation problem is in NP. So you can solve this problem in NP, whatever query you take. And there exists some fixed query Q for which the problem is NP hard. So this is what I would mean if I say data complexity of query evaluation is NP complete, all right? And at some point later in the slides, something like this will happen, and that's why I'm saying this here, okay? Okay. So, but now the situation is different. If you have conjunctive queries, then query evaluation under data complexity is actually in polynomial time. And why is this? Well, this is actually easy. If you now think about these types of problems, which problems are they? Well, all these problems are of the form you are just given a graph and your task is to find some certain kind of fixed structure in your graph. Yeah? Let's, let's take maybe a worst case example. You, I mean, 
k-click. K-click is a complicated conjunctive query. Yeah, but now this, you get a fixed conjunctive query. So let's say 27 click. Yeah? And this is now your problem. Your input is a graph, and you need to decide, is there a 27 click in this graph? How do you solve this? You write sequence of 27 nested for loops that iterate over all the uh, nodes of your graph, and then you test if everything is connected in the middle of the for loop. The program is around this long, yeah? Uh, and it runs in n to the power 27, more or less, and this is a polynomial, okay? And yeah, so this works. And this is what I mean with the brute force approach is already in polynomial time. I did not do much thinking right now to generate this algorithm, okay? Okay, so that's, that's what happens there. Mm, good, so let's, so now we have another, uh, we have made another statement. Let's take a step back again. And let's think again, uh, hmm, um, does this satisfy us with the explanation? Well, this data complexity perspective, it partly explains why query evaluation still works in practice, but maybe, yeah, maybe we are still not uh, satisfied. That this is maybe this is also because researchers are never really satisfied, and we never write a paper that says, this has now solved all problems and no further research is required on the subject. Uh, yeah. So we, are, we were still not satisfied with this answer. Uh, um, and you may also still find it non-satisfactory because, well, actually queries do become large in practice, right? You can have conjunctive queries with more than 100 atoms. I have seen these in query logs, for example. Mm, and our evaluation algorithm will definitely not scale. Yeah? If n is uh, 1 billion nodes and you have a n to the 100th algorithm, then you will have to wait uh, for a very long time to get your answer. Yeah? More, than the, more time than the processor will survive, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so this is not good enough. So there must be another reason why systems work in practice. And here is another reason. Um, queries are very, very often tree-shaped. Mm, so the query that I've shown to you in the beginning, it was, it was, this was a little bit more complicated query as this one, so I, I cut away some edges. Now it's a conjunctive query, we don't have double edges. Um, but conditions that people are looking for in, when you match them in graphs, they are very, very often tree-shaped conditions. And finding matches of tree-shaped things or tree-shape-like things, if they are not tree-shaped anymore, I will tell you a little bit more precisely what I mean by that in, in, a, in a couple of minutes. Uh, yeah, these are much easier to find than clicks. Yeah? Right. So if you have conjunctive queries that if you visualize them, they would essentially be a tree, then they can be evaluated rather efficiently no matter how big the queries are. So there is a, this is also a classic paper by Yanakakis in 1981. He proved that tree-shaped conjunctive queries can be evaluated in time um, size of the query times size of the data. Yeah? And here, yeah, and this is a worst case bound. Okay? And the algorithm that does this, if you would need to search the literature, is Yanakakis' algorithm. Mm. And this actually seems like a much more plausible reason or explanation why systems uh, work in practice. Yeah? And now this idea can actually also be generalized. Mm, queries are not always tree-shaped in practice, but whenever they are not, mm, maybe you can take like a fat marker and still draw a tree across them and, and map a put edges together with small cycles. And this idea generalizes to the notion of tree width. Okay. So, yeah, queries are very often tree-shaped, and if they are not, they closely resemble a tree. Okay, I'm not going to formally define tree width uh, in this talk. Uh, it is a bit technical, but I just want to give you like an, an idea of what tree width is. Well, what is tree width? Well, if you have a shape like this, this is a tree, yeah? there, are, there are no cycles. If there are, I don't know, I, in, in Simon's 
email. I think there was a remark about people from computational biology could be here and people from computer science. I let those people with biological background and people from computer science background debate over the fact of whether the roots of the tree are here or here. Uh, the different fields have different views on this matter, but we all kind of know more or less what a tree is, right? Okay. So things like this are trees, and they have tree with one. Okay, now if you would have something like this, this is no longer a tree, but I don't know if you have ever heard of series parallel graphs or something like that. I think this is a series parallel graph, or I hope, I don't know. Uh, this one here, uh, this is a series parallel graph. Series parallel graphs have tree with two. And now you can start adding more and more edges and more and more cycles in this thing. Uh, and then in the end you end up with k clicks and tree width is a notion that is defined in such a way that, well, the more cyclic your structure becomes, uh, the more higher, the, the higher your tree width gets and k clicks uh, are something that have tree width k minus one. Okay, and now there is a theorem that says, aha, it's just a generalization of the Yanakakis result I told you. It says that tree shaped conjunctive queries of, or Actually, yeah, tree shaped is superfluous. Conjunctive queries of tree with k can be evaluated in time size of the query to the power O of k and size of the data to the power O of k. Yeah? And this kind of gives you a better idea of what kind of queries are difficult to evaluate in practice and what kind of queries are easy to evaluate. And now if you start looking at which kind of queries people actually ask, this is m much more here than here. Yeah? And this, this explains to you why databases are not dead yet. Yeah? Okay, good. And actually, this is the complete introduction to classical database theory. This was the crash course on classical database theory. And now I guess you have a complete backpack of knowledge uh, so that I can start explaining graph database queries soon. And let's see, did I arrive at the end of the slot now? Uh -huh. So now we have, what? In two minutes. Yeah, well, let's. <laughs> it doesn't make sense to start a new topic now, so let's do the break now and then. You give the start sign. So, welcome back everybody. Uh, so now we are warmed up to talk about uh, specialized graph database queries and especially about, well, what is different in graph database queries than in uh, normal queries over relations, right? Mm. So this, it may surprise you, but I actually have a plan. Mm. So conjunctive queries, you already heard of right now. And right now, I mean, as of now, whenever I say conjunctive queries in this talk, you will have heard it. So you are already experts in conjunctive queries right now. Mm. I will explain next to you something important in graph databases and something very fundamental called regular path queries. And then we will combine these things and uh, <coughs> I will talk about conjunctive regular path queries. All right, so conjunctive queries, you know. Regular path queries, that's coming next. So um, in order to explain you about regular path queries, I at least need to remind you of some notation. Um, so in this talk, I am going to use, if n is a natural number, this n in square brackets to denote this set of numbers from one to n. Maybe I've already done that, and I don't know. Um, and uh, I will be working with regular expressions. I assume that you are familiar with regular expressions. Uh, to just to freshen it up quickly, in regular expressions you have three kinds of main operators that you use. You have the Kleene star, which I denote with a star. You have concatenation, which is omitted in the notation, similar to multiplication in algebra. 
um, and you have this junction, which is denoted with a plus. And in order to make regular expressions readable, it's convenient to use a priority system on these operators. And the priorities are, well, this Kleene star has the highest binding priority, then concatenation, and then disjunction. So this thing here is a regular expression. I can omit brackets now. Mm, and it, what does it match? Which language? Well, it matches the word AB, and it also matches all words that start with a C and then have zero or more Ds after that. Okay. Mm, the language of a regular expression R, I will denote this with L of R. Mm, and yeah, as far as I know, this is all rather standard notation. And what I will also do is if I write something, if R is a regular expression, and I write something like R to the power N, then I want to abbreviate with this the n-fold concatenation of R. What does this mean? Well, this means just n copies of R uh, behind each other. Yeah? This is just a short notation. So if I write a to the power 4, and A is an is a alphabet symbol or symbol from the set of uh, symbols for edge labels, then this is an abbreviation for AAAA. Okay? Good. So, yeah, that's regular expression notation. Good. Now, I will talk about regular path queries, and regular path queries will have something to do with regular expressions. Yeah? Mm, first of all, before I explain what regular path queries are, let's just tell you a little bit about why research and why graph database systems are perhaps interested in regular path queries. Well, mm, if you look at what is the power of conjunctive queries, which kind of properties conjunctive queries can express in graphs, um, then these properties are local properties in graphs. Like even the most, con yeah. If you have a conjunctive query with 15 edges, well, they can exp express properties of nodes in your graph which are at most 15 edges apart, right? So um, this is what I mean with locality. So conjunctive queries only express properties in your graph that are so far apart as the size of your conjunctive query. And a similar result even holds for much more general queries. So for first order, if I would use first order logic to specify queries, which kind of captures the, the core of the entire SQL language, yeah, or the core of relational algebra, this still mm, can only express local properties. And there are these papers of Kaifman and Hanf that make this notion formal. Yeah? Mm. How these proofs work is not very important uh, for this talk, but I just want to mention this uh, because this explains why regular path queries are kind of something new compared to what you see in relational algebra and in first order logic um, because they can um, they can allow you to reason about things in graphs that are far apart. Yeah? They use regular expressions to query paths. Okay, so what is a path? Mm, a path in a graph database G, this is a sequence P of edges in your graph. So, yeah, it's all, yeah, these are all supposed to be edges in the graph, and it's not just an arbitrary sequence of edges. Of course, um, these edges need to be kind of connected to each other so that they really form a path in your graph, right? So uh, the end node of your first edge must be the starting node of your second edge and so on and so forth, okay? So that's a path. Right, now a regular path query. This is an expression of this form. So it looks similar to the way that I denoted an atom in a conjunctive query, and this is not by coincidence. Um, and yeah, the difference now with an atom in a conjunctive query, as I've used it before, is that now um, on top of the edge, I can write a regular expression R. Yeah? So now R is a regular expression 
over sigma, so this set of labels that we um, um, use to label our edges in the graph, right? And sigma is an infinite set, but r is a finite expression, so r can only mention a finite subset of sigma, okay? Just to... So what um, do regular path queries do? Uh, how are they evaluated? Well, the general idea, I will have to make this more precise later, there are different variants. The general idea is that regular path queries like this with variable x and y, they return pairs of nodes in your graph. Yeah? And a regular path query like this returns the node pair u, v, if and only if there exists some path from u to v, it can be a very weird and complicated <coughs> path, mm, such that if you take the sequence of edge labels yeah, along this path, then this sequence forms a word in the language of R. This is the general philosophy of regular path queries. Okay. Good, so let's look at an example. We have our artists again, and let's consider the regular path query uh, which, yeah, X, uh, which searches for pairs of nodes X and Y in your graph, such that there is a path labeled with some word in H star. Yeah? H was this hierarchy stuff. Yeah? So let's see what this thing returns. Well, it returns, it returns, for example, guitarist, guitarist, because, well, what is the path that matches this? Well, it's the empty path, yeah? So the empty word is in this language H star, and this is why this thing is returned. What is also returned? Guitarist, instrumentalist, because here we have a path from here to here, it's labeled with H, and this is a word in this language, all right? Uh, we also get guitarist musician, guitarist artist, and so on and so forth, and you get all of these things. And maybe, you, I mean, you will also get this, I don't know if you expected this, mm, but you also get pairs like United States, United States. I mean, you get pairs of nodes that seemingly do not have anything to do with this hierarchy, but between United States and United States, there is still the empty path, and empty path matches this, so this is returned, yeah? So if, if, for example, yeah, if you would write this query and on this graph, then maybe even this query is not what you intended, and maybe you meant H, H plus, yeah, like at least one H, H. I don't know, yeah, see? But this is how these things work. Okay, oh wait, uh, any further questions about this example? No. All right, good, so, Let's make what you have just seen a little bit more formal. Um, <clears throat> so let R be a regular expression and G be a graph. Then I say that a path P in G, this is a path P, it matches R if, well, the concatenation of the edge labels on the path P is a word in the language of R. Good. Mm, if I now take a regular path query and a graph, then the answer of the regular path query Q on the graph G is, I denote it again with Q of G, it's the set of node pairs mm, from G such that there exists a path P from U to V in G which matches the expression, okay? Yeah, seems simple enough, right? Okay, and um, yeah, in order to not overburden the notation sometimes, um, I, yeah, I'm, I sometimes omit this letter Q, yeah? Because a regular path query actually only has one substantial ingredient, which is the regular expression. The variables are always, well, X, Y, yeah? And the regular expression is the only thing. So sometimes I just denote the entire thing with the expression R, okay? So, yeah, I sometimes also write this Q of G as R of G. Okay, so what's coming next? What I have explained to you is the so-called every path semantics of regular path queries. And here the story, is, here the story will become a little bit more uh, subtle. Um, because if you look into the literature and also into database systems, what they say about regular path queries, 
Sometimes regular path queries are even called different. In Sparkle, they are called property paths, for example. Mm. So if you're going to look how people define the semantics of regular path queries, so what a regular path query should return, you will find different notions. Um, so what I explained to you was every path semantics. It means every path is okay. But people also look at simple path semantics, trail, sem trail semantics, and shortest path semantics. And the differences between these are really significant. It can make a huge complexity difference, and we will talk about this later. Mm. In the remainder of the talk, I will be talking about these three, mostly. Okay? Yeah. So why will we consider these different type of semantics? Well, in a sense, each of these, for each of these semantics, you can come up with some reason why it's important. So every path semantics, this is the one that you will find, I don't know, hundreds of papers about. Uh, academia has researched every path semantics a lot. Mm. A variant of simple path semantics was standard in the language Sparkle for a while. Mm, now, not anymore. Uh, simple path semantics was the first one that was studied. Actually, this is the one that was studied in the paper uh, that introduced regular path queries from the end of the 80s. And then trail semantics, this is the default in uh, the query language Cypher right now, which is a, yeah, which is a widely used language uh, at the moment for querying graphs by this Neo4j. Right, so all of these kind of have their yeah, reason to be alive. Mm. And currently there is this standardization effort going on and members of this Open Cypher project were discussing recently which of the semantics to use for this language Cypher and the consensus seemed to be, let's have them all. Yeah, and let, the, yet let users choose between which semantics they need. So, and this is why I'm going to explain and, and going to talk about these different kinds of semantics in, in, in my talk. Okay, so the last definition, a little bit more precisely. So, uh, I should maybe say the answer of my regular path query Q on my graph G under every path semantics is what I just said before. It's the node pairs U, V such that there exists a path from U to V in G that matches R. As we see here, no restriction on the path. Yeah, no constraint on the path, and hence every path is eligible for the query, and this is why I'm calling this every path semantics. All right, so now what are simple paths and trails? Well, this is easy, easiest to explain with a couple of pictures, because it's very intuitive. So this is clearly a path from U to V, right? Now, in every path semantics, nothing uh, forbids me for doing something like this. I could go from U to V like this, and since I like this part very much, I make another tour here, and then I continue like this. Yeah, this is still a path. It's still a sequence of edges that starts from U and ends in V, but I have some duplicates, but I don't care about that. Yeah? Mm, right. So this is a path. This is not a trail. What is a trail? A trail is a path in which you do not, you do not have duplicate edges. Yeah? If I do this here and I do this again, then there will be some edge here that I have visited twice, and this is not allowed in trails. It is also not a simple path, because a simple path does not allow duplicate nodes. Yeah? So yeah, if there is an edge here that I have visited twice in my tour, then I have visited each of the nodes in this edge twice, and this is also not allowed. So this here is also not a simple path. Uh, this here is a trail, yeah, but not a simple path, all right? So in a trail, I can actually visit a node twice as long as I don't visit one of the adjacent edges twice, okay? So trails can have loops, okay? And if I remove all the loops, then I have a path which is also a trail and which is also a simple path, all right? So, yeah, that's it. Good, so I hope that the intuitions, uh, that, that the pictures at least already made the concept clear. Now let's make it, uh, let's make it formal. Mm, so let P here be a path. We say that it is a simple path if, well, the starting node and the end node appear exactly once and every node in the middle here 
appears exactly twice, namely here at the end of the tuple and at the start of the ne next tuple. Yeah, this means you visit every node exactly once. It is a trail if every edge appears exactly once. Ah, wait a minute. This is something I corrected yesterday evening. I, said, I, th I thought, oh, I can make this clearer and I will write exactly once. But actually, also the empty path uh, is a simple path and a trail. So I should write everywhere at most once or at most twice. Yeah. Okay, I will correct this again. Yeah, okay. Good. So, mm, now that we know what simple paths and trails are, um, I can just take a copy of the last definition and just have this extra restriction and then I have the set of answers or the answer of the query Q on G under simple path semantics. I mean, I'm writing this like this, Q of G and then I'm writing this S for simple path semantics. These are the node pairs UV such that there is a simple path from U to V that matches the expression. And then for trails, it's exactly the same and I just write uh, there exists a trail instead of there exists a simple path. And whenever I mean trail semantics, I'm writing this T here as an index, okay? So that's that. And now we have three different definitions of how regular path queries can be evaluated. And yeah, I will, I want to take a look with you later about what, what, is, what are the complexity difference, differences between these because actually there are uh, complexity differences. Maybe first to uh, see that you are not completely falling asleep right now because you're digesting cake and, and uh, it's getting late and maybe let's just uh, take a look at an example and let's see, uh, uh, um, let's look at this graph. Let's look at a couple of regular path queries and let's see if they return the pair one, four, yes or no. So the question is always the same. Do this, do they return the pair one, four, under, and then the question is under which semantics, all right? So let's take this expression here first, A, A star. So it's paths that are labeled with A's and the paths have even length, okay? So the question here from one to four, yeah. Is there a path of even length? Well, let's do the following. I count to three and we are computer scientists, so we raise a one or a zero, or maybe this is, huh? One means yes, zero means no, and yeah, so we, you move a little bit, and your blood will go from your hand back to your brain, and you wake up again, so you can raise both hands if you want. Uh, yeah. Okay, so let's just try this. Uh, take this one, uh, yeah. So the one four, is this returned under uh, every path semantics, yes or no? Yeah, seems yes. Simple path semantics, yes. Trail semantics, yes, because the simplest path possible satisfies everything, all right? So this is good. Okay, now let's take the second one. Odd length. Let's see. Uh, is there a path of odd length? Let's, let's just try this. And if you did not have enough time to think, just generate a random bit and it will disappear in the noise. Nobody will notice this. <laughs> <laughs> this is not the goal of the exercise. We just need to do a bit of it. <laughs> okay, uh, we sit too much in our jobs. Okay, so let's take this one. What do you say about, is there a path of odd length? Oh, okay, well, see, you had enough time to look at it. Uh, is there a simple path of odd length? Oh, very consistent, okay. Is there a trail of odd length? Mm, good, let's see what I thought when I was preparing this. Okay, I think there is no simple path and no trail. Mm, any questions about this? Wait, let's see. Um, so there is this path, one, two, three, four, five. Actually, I think this is the only path of odd length from here to here, you go around once. But this, oh, sure, yeah. 
Oh my God, of course. There are infinitely many. Yeah, yeah, sure. This is, uh, but if you do it more often, it does not become more trail or simple path like. Yes. This is why I was mainly focusing on this path. Yeah. Yes. Mm, all right. Now the last one. Let's, let's just uh, go a bit uh, quicker now. So what do we have now? If now we are allowed to alternate with A's and B's, you can, do, you can go like this. You can do A, B, A, B, A. And now you noticed that I have not used any edge twice, right? So actually, there is a path. And in particular, there is also a path that is a trail. But as far as I know, all these trails are not uh, simple paths because they reuse nodes. OK. So you kind of see now that, well, if you would be a graph database engine, then the work you need to do to evaluate trails and simple paths this is kind of different from the work that you have to do if you, yeah, if you don't have to care about the paths, right? This is, this is kind of different problems. Good. <clears throat> okay. So before we really go to the, uh, the formal aspects of uh, evaluating these things, let's, uh, yeah, let's generalize regular path queries and bring them together with conjunctive queries, and then we get conjunctive regular path queries. So what is this? Well, since you already know the ingredients, I think I can be rather quick here. Uh, so a conjunctive regular path query, and people write this as a CRPQ. This is an expression of this form. So it looks like a conjunctive query. But instead of having a single label on each atom, I just write a regular expression. So it is a conjunction of regular path queries. Yeah? And to these individual regular path queries here in this thing, uh, I will probably sometimes also refer to as atoms of the query. Mm -hmm. So the rest is the same. Huh? So x is an output tuple. Uh, it only has variables that also occur here. And uh, yeah, each of these things is a regular path query. OK, good. Mm, yeah, and since every single symbol is also a regular expression, it means that every conjunctive query over graphs is also a conjunctive regular path query. Yeah? So this is a, a strict generalization of uh, conjunctive queries over graphs. Good. Now, the answers of such queries over graphs are very similar to what we have talked about for answering uh, conjunctive queries, but now we blend this with what we did for regular path queries, right? So now I say, if I have this, if this is a conjunctive regular path query and I have my graph, then the set of answers of the query on the graph under every path semantics is, well, as I write it as always, it is, um, well, I need to find homomorphisms from the variables of my query to the nodes in the graph, yeah? So it means, uh, yeah, homomorphisms. But now, ah, yes. Now I mean that um, if I map my two end nodes to two nodes in the graph, then this here must be a result of evaluating the regular path query on the edge. Yeah? OK, and whenever I can embed this entire pattern in such a homomorphic way in my graph, it gives me an answer. So then. Uh, it's again exactly the same as what we have seen before. If I can match this entire pattern in my graph, obeying all the constraints that my pattern is telling me, uh, then wherever I can match the output nodes, this will produce an answer to the query. OK, so this is the answers of the query on the graph under every path semantics. Now, under simple path and trail semantics, it's completely analogous. The difference is that well, here I give it, of course, the correct name. I need to change the name of the property, right? And then here I say, aha, uh -huh, this pair of nodes, um, it, this pair of nodes must be an answer of this regular expression on G under simple path semantics or under trail semantics, right? So I, 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 in this case, I restrict the answers even more 
because here I don't allow arbitrary paths, but only simple paths. And in this case, I restrict this condition by saying everything must be matched to a trail. Yeah. Okay. So then, now we have conjunctive regular path queries. Mm. And I will denote it yeah, just similar to how I've done it before. I write a small s for simple path semantics and a small t for trail semantics. All right, so let's look at an example again. So here I have a query. In order to understand this query a bit better, let's perhaps visualize it. So what are we looking for? We are looking for triples in the graph, triples x, y, z, such that they are on this kind of cycle. Yeah? So from x to y, there is a path that matches a star. From y to z, there is a b star. Um, um, path and from z to x there is an a star uh, again. Okay, let's take the same graph as before and let's try to see if we understand which kind of answers uh, we have here. Uh, so let's see. One, two, three. One, two, three. Uh, is this an answer of this query here? Now what do I have? I have arbitrary path semantics. Mm. Let's see. Well, let's see what you think. Let's, yeah, what you think. Just raise some hands. Yeah, some people are saying, yeah, fine. Some, uh, yeah, looks good. I also think this looks good because there, let's see, there is an A edge here. There is a B star. You can do this to satisfy this B star. And then from three to one, you, we can satisfy A star again. Now, of course, you could potentially also get uh, answers like this, right? Because nothing is saying me that x, y, and z should be matched to different nodes, right? They could be matched maybe to the same node. So let's think about this. One, two, two, would this be fine? Okay, what does this query say? Um, I need an A star path from one to two. Yeah, that's fine. From two to two, there is a B star path. Yes, because the empty path is fine here with the B star. And then I need um, from this two to this two, um, I need an A star path again. Ah, and actually, I could go like this, over this A and over this A, and this is again fine. So one, two, two is actually also an answer. One, one, one. Okay, maybe I've prepared too many examples here. <laughs> uh, well, let's just do this one more. Um, one, one, one. If everything is here, then actually the question is just, is there an I, yeah? is there an a star path from here to here again. Yeah, there is, so actually this is also an answer. And now we're getting tired, let's do this one as homework maybe, okay? <laughs> All right, so that's that. Now I hope that uh, you have kind of a feeling of how conjunctive regular path queries work and how um, what simple path semantics and what trail semantics and every path semantics could mean in graph databases. So now perhaps it makes sense to start thinking about query evaluation. I yes. Have a question about notation. Yes. Slide, yeah. Sure. Yeah. So the like the initial formulation Q A B A of X Y Z. Yes. So if we wanted to use something more um, complicated like what Ah, oh, um, you mean like, like here? Some star, right? Yes, so yes, yes. A, B star. Yeah, but then I would just write A, B star on the edge. Okay, and yeah. what about that on the left? Uh, what, where you have Q subscript A, B, A? Oh, here? Yeah. Oh, this Q, Q subscript A, B, A, this is just the name of the query. Oh, okay. I could just as well have written Q there. That's not uh, this is, no, this was not a descriptive notation. This is just some random name I gave to the, or almost random name I gave to the query. Yes, yes, yeah, exactly, good. Okay, so query, and thank you for this question, by the way. This, <laughs> this is always very useful information for me, and at least it tells me how far did people fall, do there still exist people in the room who are, <laughs> who are with me? So thank you. <laughs> okay. 
so yeah, and again, if you have questions, don't hesitate. Yeah, it's all. Uh, yes, yes. Yes. You can you can define this. Yeah, mm, uh, let's see. D yeah, this is always you. If you talk to different people, you will get different opinions <laughs> about this. But actually, in in the theoretical research, uh, I've seen papers of people that are looking at more expressive languages for for matching against paths. For instance, context-free languages. Or there are also people who are, who are considering uh, um, uh, paths that you group together and then you even put some rational relation or something on this. So, so yeah. If you work in theory, nothing but your imagination will limit you. Right? It may be possible that you get rejected uh, because you cannot convince some PC members of the use of the thing that you're doing. This can always happen. But, but, but people, people look at this and work like this gets accepted to the serious theory uh, conferences. Yeah. I have not seen work yet that, that would just say, let's take polynomial time. Uh, uh, that, would be pretty, uh, that would be pretty powerful. Mm. Yeah, uh, yeah, but uh, but in principle, all this all this is possible and could could make sense. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And also the other way around, there are also people considering well, questions like, look, what if regular languages is even is too much. What if we just restrict this to something very, very small? You can also do work in there. Actually, I do some of this work. <laughs> uh, so I think that some of these questions can potentially make sense. Yeah. <clears throat> so what is the class that you consider? This is class of regular languages. Oh, um, I actually hope to be able to explain this tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. But we will have to see a bit how far we get. But. Uh, Okay. Good. So, yeah. Mm, yeah. Let's look at query evaluation, and let's look at uh, the same plan because it seemed to work last time. Uh, uh, we can try to do it again. Again, conjunctive queries. We have a room of experts in conjunctive queries, so you know what happened there. So let's go to uh, uh, regular path queries. I okay. I, I meant here. I have already explained this. Okay. <laughs> so regular path queries. Good. Now, if I'm going to explain uh, uh, evaluation of regular path queries on graphs, it will be useful in at least one example to know something about finite automata. I assume that you have seen some finite automata, very good automata before. So pictures like this one make sense to you. Uh, so then I only have to say, uh, what notation I will use. Uh, so uh, I will denote a non-deterministic finite automaton as a tuple here, uh, which has the following ingredients. I have a set of uh, finite set of states S. A is the finite alphabet. Delta is the transition relation. Yeah, it takes a state and then uh, an alphabet symbol, and then it goes to a next state, basically. Mm. I is a set of initial states, F is a set of accepting states, or if you really want to have a word that starts with F, you can call them final states. Um, and then I denote the language of such a non-deterministic finite automaton N with L of N, just in the same way as I, as I do for regular expressions. Okay, and then in the example, yeah, this is something I guess you can check later when the slides are online, if I did not make a typo here or if I did make a typo here. But if you know this, then this is superfluous, I guess. Okay. So, 
which kind of problems will we consider? Well, similar kind of problems than the ones that we have seen for conjunctive queries. So uh, regular path query evaluation. Let's first look at every path semantic, so we allow every possible path. Mm, we are given a graph database G, a pair UV of nodes, and then a regular path query Q, and the answer is just, is UV an answer to the query Q on this graph? Good. Um, for conjunctive regular path queries, the question is defined completely analogously. The only difference is that now I don't get a regular path query, but I get a conjunctive regular path query, and I will get tuples of nodes. Yeah. Good. And the decision problems, these two decision problems for simple path semantics and trail semantics are defined completely analogously, only that here I will have a small letter S or T, and here the same. Good. So let's first give, uh, to get to start happy, uh, let's uh, give a positive sounding result, which says that regular path query evaluation under every path semantics is in polynomial time. Polynomial time sounds good, right? So um, how does this work? The argument is, is, is rather easy, actually. Um, so let this be the regular path query, let G be the graph, and let UV <coughs> be the pair of nodes that you're interested in. So now what we need to do is we need to test if there is a path in your graph from U to V that matches R, right? This is what we need to do. Okay, let's just take uh, uh, the non-deterministic finite automaton or some non-deterministic finite automaton for R. There is one that you can compute in polynomial time. Yeah? Mm, the basic plan is you construct a product between the graph G and then your automaton N, treating the node U in G as an initial state and then V as an, an, an accepting state, and then you test if the intersection between the two languages is empty. This is like the high level, the one, one sentence proof, if you're familiar with the, the, the material. Yeah? I will show a picture in a minute so that uh, it becomes absolutely clear, I hope. Mm, so yeah, so you construct this product and you accept if and only if there is a path from uh, some initial state together with U to some uh, accepting state with V in this product. Good, so let's look at this in an example. What does this do? So let's say that this is my graph. It's not the most exciting graph, but, uh, but it, at least it allows me to illustrate the point very clearly. Mm, and suppose that even length here is my regular path query. So I can compute this automaton for that. And if I want to know if one, two is in, is in the set of answers, what do I do? As I said, I will start constructing this product. But before I do it, I change my graph to a non-deterministic finite automaton and node one will become an initial state and node two will become an accepting state. And now I do the standard construction for intersection emptiness that you will probably have seen in your automata theory course. Mm. And how does this work? Well, you start in the product of, yeah, the product start state. So it's the combination of Q1 and one. And then, well, if I would read an A from Q1 here, I go to Q2. If I would read an A from here in state one, I go to two. So this brings me here in the pair Q2, two. Yeah, and then I just continue like that. If I read an A from here again, I go back to Q1. And if I read an A in state two here, I would go to state three. So this brings me in this pair and I continue on and on. And actually, when I arrive here, I already know that I have reached an accepting state, so I could already stop and say, oh, I know that one, two is an answer, but let's construct the complete product. And yeah, now we see here that this product is not empty. Yeah, it doesn't define the empty language. And for this reason, uh, this pair one, two is returned uh, by this regular path query on this graph. Why okay. Is it's not, I just, you mean, you mean, you mean the step after this one, it's not important, but on the last slide I said, 
construct the product and then do that. And here, I have not yet constructed the product. So this was just for consistency <laughs> with what I said in the, last, uh, in the last slide. I mean, if you are really making an algorithm for this, then, then here you stop, right? You know that, that this is the answer. Mm, now, if you really want to make good and fast algorithms for this, then maybe you will also revert to other approaches than, than doing this. Yeah? So what I'm trying to optimize here is understandability uh, of the concepts. Yeah? This is not, I don't mean to give you a efficient algorithms with indices and uh, yeah, mm, that allows you to do, to do all this stuff extremely quickly. No, this is, this is an algorithm that will run in polynomial time. Right? What's the algorithm? The algorithm is, the algorithm is construct this product and return yes, so accept if and only if in this product construction there is some path from here to here. And on this picture, that means, so this is, this would be the product, this is the entire product, the size of this product is size of this times size of this, so it's polynomial. And then the algorithm says, test if there exists a path in this product from the start to an, an accepting state. And if this is the case, you return yes. And if this is not the case, you return no. That's the algorithm. You see, this is a very high level description of an algorithm and it involves a reachability test on, on, on something, yeah? But this is something that will run in polynomial time. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good. Now, whatever I said just now, this fine, happy world about polynomial time kind of starts disappearing when you uh, restrict your paths to simple paths or trails, yeah? Mm, right, now this next part, let's see. Mm, let's do another, let's do another, oh wait, yes? So, you in the complexity, there's a lot of test automata. Yes. And ah. you say that you count the length of the visualization and these two notions can just exponentially blow up. Yeah, the automaton is non-deterministic, yes. Yeah, yeah, so this is, this will be, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, thank you, yeah, good question. Mm, you know what, this is going to be a slightly different topic. Let's again do maybe a couple of minutes break so that uh, we can get some air again and then continue, continue after that. <coughs> So actually this last question uh, that was asked here was very interesting yeah? because this is something that uh, when you think about such high level steps for algorithms, you indeed have to watch out for. Yeah? So this question was, wait a minute, if you convert, uh, uh, wait, what is this? If you convert a regular expression to an automaton, don't you have to worry about an exponential step? Yeah? Of course, if I would convert a regular expression to a deterministic automaton, then I would have to worry about an exponential step, yeah? because then you get uh, uh, an exponential blow up in the worst case. And uh, in fact, so, but now I'm, this algorithm is fine with that, because I only want to convert to a non-deterministic automaton. And then it's known that you can all do this in, in polynomial time. Um, what some people may not be aware of is if I would start from a non-deterministic finite automaton and I would claim, oh, let's convert this to a regular expression, then this is also a step that you need to pay attention for because this is in general also uh, not possible in polynomial time. Yeah? Even though both models are non-deterministic, um, you can have an exponential blow up if you go from a non-deterministic automaton to a regular expression. So you have to have in mind which direction you are doing, you are doing here. Yeah. Ah, and by the way, yeah, uh, 
if any of you during the lecture also thinks, oh, wait a minute, this is something I don't understand very well, and I want to, uh, but I do not want to ask this on YouTube, uh, <laughs> Uh, you can just uh, you can just ask me in the break. Yeah, just come to me, and and I will be happy to to try to uh, explain a couple of extra uh, things to you. Okay, so next part. Let's look at regular path query evaluation, and now with these extra restrictions. So if we can have every path, arbitrary paths, then evaluation is easy, but under simple path semantics, if I don't want node repetitions, then this problem becomes NP-complete. So why is this? Well, there is actually a rather intuitive and easy to understand reason for this if you have, I don't know how large your backpack of NP-complete problems is, but uh, if you think about paths without node repetitions, this starts, uh, maybe some bells start ringing already and you think, yeah, this sounds like you can encode some famous problem in here. And this is absolutely true. And how does this work? Mm, so the input again, yeah, just to remind you, you have the regular expression here, essentially, you have your, uh, you have your graph G and then you have your pair of nodes, and you want to know um, if there is a simple path from node u to node v that matches the expression. Okay, the problem is clearly in NP because, well, the, the, that's the easy direction of the proof. The NP algorithm can just guess a path from u to v one step in a time and then check if it is simple that you're not repeating nodes and then check if it matches R. So you guess something polynomially large and you check. The lower bound, you can do a reduction from, let's say, a directed version of the Hamiltonian path problem. Yeah, uh, how do you do that? Well, let's take an input of the Hamiltonian path problem. So what is, what does this problem say? You're given a directed graph with n nodes and then a pair, u, v, of nodes, and then the question is, is there a path from u to v that visits all the nodes in the graph and visits them exactly once? Yeah, clearly you can encode this here, right? Because let's turn this graph into a graph database, which means let's label every edge with a, yeah? uh, and then this original graph has a Hamiltonian path from u to v, if and only if, well, in this new graph, there is a simple path of length n minus one, right? Yeah, and yeah, this is the expression, the, 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 the Hamiltonian path condition is completely encoded in this regular expression. The Hamiltonian path says, is there a simple path of length n minus one from there to there, and I just repeat this in my graph. So almost trivially, uh, this problem is NP-complete. Good. Mm, now, you may be thinking again, wait a minute. We've been in a situation like this before. Uh, this type of query, suppose that I have a graph database with one million nodes. Which user is going to ask this kind of query? Is there a path of length one million from this node to this? That seems like a lot of typing. Yeah? So you, you see, okay, fair enough, this problem is hard, but come on, nobody does such a complicated thing in practice. Yeah? Now granted, sometimes if you look around in practice, this thing, nobody does such a complicated, it also doesn't hold because when I saw this, I also thought nobody will do this in practice, but people do it. Mm, okay, uh, so let's, let's try to get another perspective on this again, and we will revert to similar perspectives that we've seen before. So this problem is not just NP-hard, it's actually, let's just call it very NP-hard. I'm not going to define, oh, well, I can define this formally, I just mean, it's, the problem is even hard under uh, data complexity, yeah? So the queries that I just generated, the Hamiltonian path queries, these are not fixed, right? 
because the query depends on the number of nodes in your graph. But, mm, yeah. But, actually, regular path query evaluation under simple path semantics, this is even NP-hard for this query here. And what is this one? You actually have been thinking about this one already. This one just tests for even length of paths. Yeah? And as is often the case from NP-hardness of problems, once you know the correct problem to reduce from, uh, the proof can become easy. <laughs> and this is also the case here, because uh, what is an NP-complete problem? Well, the even length simple path problem is, a <laughs> is an NP-complete problem, so the reduction is again going to be not very complicated. The, the, the most difficult part of the proof is searching for the good problem to reduce from, yeah? Mm, but, okay, but also if you think about this problem for a while actually, so even length simple path, it's actually, the first time you meet this problem, it's surprising that this is, that there are no efficient algorithms for this that we know, right? Uh, um, this seems like something simple, but yeah, it's not. So what is this problem? You're given a directed graph G, a pair UV of nodes. Is there a simple path of even length from U to V? So perhaps surprisingly, nobody knows an efficient algorithm for this. Uh, the problem is proved to be NP-complete in this, in this paper. So it's from the 1980s. So this is long known to be NP-complete. Okay, yeah, and of course, once you have this, the reduction is trivial, okay, yeah? So you, you label everything with an A, and then you have a simple path from U to V, if and only if uh, 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 um, UV is in an answer of this query, okay? Right. Now, I can do the same for another regular path query, which also looks quite innocent, actually, at first sight, yeah? Also for this query, so A star, B, A star. Also for this query, um, regular, path query, uh, regular path query evaluation under simple path semantics is NP-hard. So what is the problem we choose now to reduce from? Well, let's take two disjoint paths on directed graphs. So which is also, what is also a hard problem? If you're given a directed graph and two node pairs, U1, V1, and U2, V1, are there node disjoint paths, so path P1 from U1 to V1, and path P2 from U2 to V2, yeah? so that these two paths don't have any common nodes. Yeah? I mean, that, that's what I mean with no disjoint. And this is also a uh, famous NP-complete problem. This is known from since 1980. This is NP-complete. And, well, how do we encode this problem into the evaluation problem for this graph? Okay, here I have written it down in two lines formally, but with the picture it's even easier to understand. So suppose you want to decide if there are node disjoint paths in this graph, yeah, from here to here and from here to here. How do you encode this into the graph evaluation algorithm? Well, you take your graph G, you label every edge in G with an A, now you add one edge labeled B from here to here, and then of course there is a simple path from here to here labeled A star B A star, if and only if the original graph had no disjoint paths, okay? So yeah, again, a very simple, very simple reduction. For those people worried in the room that I will only talk about trivial reductions, uh, I can, this will not always be the case. There will be harder uh, reductions uh, uh, later on, yeah? Mm, but uh, yeah, these, these happen to be simple. What should I do? Yeah? <coughs> Okay, now trail semantics. Um, now there is a nice trick. If you already have hardness of problems under simple path semantics, now there is a nice encoding trick you can use to show very often that these problems are also hard under trail semantics. Uh, yeah, what do you do? Okay, you can, you could also reduce from two edge disjoint paths. Yeah, you, uh, this is another way of saying it. Uh, I am going to use the trick to show that two edge disjoint paths is NP-complete, yeah? 
And this is the same problem as no disjoint parts, but now I am asking for the existence of two parts uh, that don't have an edge in common. Yeah, what do you do? You reduce from two no disjoint parts and you compute the so-called split graph. So in your original graph on which you want to solve the node disjoint path problem, you take every node like this and you turn it into this. Yeah, and now in this original graph, there you have two node disjoint paths, if, if and only if in this new graph you have two edge disjoint paths. And then mm, this shows that this problem is also NP-complete, and then with the same reduction as before, you can show that this problem under trail semantics is NP-complete. Okay, good, so this here is NP-complete. Uh, yeah, same reduction as before. Right, now, mm, yeah, I wanted to give you one more insight. Um, so trail semantics and now even length. Mm, I could, I guess, do a similar trick with this split uh, thing to show this as well from, from, from the node problem. Mm, but I wanted to do something else to, yeah, to show you how this two disjoint paths problem is connected to the even length problem. Because if you believe that two disjoint paths is hard, then you can get this, from this you can also easily prove that even the even length problem is hard. Why? Well, yeah, let's, let's do this for a minute. Let's reduce from two edge disjoint paths. Okay, let's take an input from the two disjoints for the two disjoint path problem, and now do the following. In this graph G, you turn every edge into this, just two edges, okay? Um, and you add a single edge from your first target to your second source. What does this mean? Well, all the edges that already existed in G are now two edges, so all the paths you can make there between nodes that were originally in G, they have even length, right? Now you have added one more edge from here to here, which means that there is an odd length trail from here to here if and only if in your original graph you had uh, these joint paths, right? So, okay, now we are almost there. We are at odd length. If we now add a new edge and node uh, 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 from V2, then there is uh, a trail from U1 to this new node of even length if and only if this original graph had a um, two edge disjoint path solution. So this is another way, uh, another way to prove this. Okay, very good. So this is the overview of, uh, of regular path queries. Now I can still explain to you how everything comes together for conjunctive regular path queries, because this is not uh, the, big, the big step. Here we had uh, the, the, the most work actually. Yeah, so now if we want to evaluate conjunctive regular path queries under every path semantics, this is NP complete. Why is this? Well, the lower bound is immediate from conjunctive queries because these things are more general than conjunctive queries and we proved our NP hardness a while ago. That was this three colorability thing. The upper bound, well, let's take the query. For each regular expression RI that you have here, Ah, if you have every path semantics, what you can do is actually, you can compute in polynomial time a relation, like a binary relation, containing all these pairs, all the answers to this regular path query. How do you do this? Well, I have shown to you before that this query answering problem for regular path queries is in polynomial time. That was the positive result without the restrictions on paths. Um, so you can just, for every pair of nodes in your graph, test, is this an answer, yes or no? And if it's an answer, you put it in this relation Ri, and if it's not, you don't put it in there. So in polynomial time, you can compute this entire relation, yeah? Mm, for every regular expression here. Which means, yeah, what does this mean? Now, uh, after doing this step, well, what are you left with? You now have a conjunctive query that you can evaluate over this 
ordinary database of these relations Ri, th these pairs. So evaluation for Q is exactly the same as evaluation of this conjunctive query mm, over the relations Ri. Yeah, and that's what you can do. And this is in NP. Yeah. Mm, and this reduction also gives you something else because it gives you some correspondence between conjunctive query evaluation and conjunctive regular path query evaluation. Yeah? So if you have a class of conjunctive regular path queries, and now you can say, let's look at their shape. Okay? And I told you in the conjunctive query part that if the shape of this thing is a tree, or if it has a constant tree width, then they can be evaluated in polynomial time. And, well, this reduction implies that if your shape of your conjunctive regular path query is a tree, then you can also evaluate these in polynomial time. Because the only extra step, so wait, that's which we had here is, so just compute these binary relations, yeah? Uh, you can do this in polynomial time, and then the question exactly the same as evaluating this thing as if it would be a conjunctive query. Yeah, so this is kind of a meta result, if you will. Yeah. So um, yeah, if C is a class of conjunctive regular path queries and C rel would be the class of ordinary conjunctive queries, which, yeah, or which correspond to this, then uh, evaluation for C under every path semantics is tractable if and only if evaluation for these relational queries that you get from this is tractable, yeah? So this allows you to transfer polynomial time results. Good, yeah? So by the results that we had on conjunctive, tree-shaped conjunctive queries, we also know that evaluation on tree-shaped conjunctive regular path queries is also tractable. Right, okay, at least for simple path and trail semantics, it doesn't get worse than, uh, than NP-completeness. So, yeah, very simple here. Lower bound we already proved uh, for even length and for two disjoint paths. The NP upper bound is just by a simple guess and check algorithm, actually. Mm, right. Here, in particular, we do not have a similar corollary than uh, about the shape of conjunctive regular path queries versus the, the, yeah, with the structure, because of course we just already proved that already for this query with a single atom that tests even length, uh, this type of problem is hard. Yeah? Good. So this is an overview. Mm, from a theoretical point of view, the world is happy here. Uh, and here it looks, uh, here maybe you think uh, this looks a bit strange. And still, yeah, I'm repeating this thing more often, yeah? Database systems are surviving, and even graph database systems are, su are surviving, and there also must be some kind of explanation for that, even though, even though we have this here, yeah? And, and, and actually there is uh, also an explanation for that, but I will come to this later, or at least some explanation that I think is a useful one, yeah. Mm, yeah. Different people may have different opinions, of course, yeah? Good. Um, yes, now the next thing that I'm going to talk about is query containment. Uh, yeah, I will still be able to start this because this part, this thing has two parts. Uh, a short one on regular path queries. I will still be able to explain that. And then there is a proof for conjunctive regular path queries and this is a bit longer and, 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 and let's, do that, uh, let's do that one tomorrow. Okay, so let's explain to you what this problem is and, yeah, and what it means on, on regular path queries. So, um, the containment problem for queries, these are problems of the kind, well, does every result that one query return me, is, is every such result also an answer of a second query, yeah? So you're given two queries, so you're given no data, yeah? Mm, you're given two queries, Q1 and Q2. 
are the answers from Q1 on a graph G a subset of the answers of Q2 on a graph G for every graph G? This is the problem. And this type of questions, of course, you can consider for regular path queries, for conjunctive regular path queries, then different kinds of semantics, and so on and so forth. But this is always, this is always the same question. Yeah? Is the set of answers of query one uh, a subset of the set of answers by, of query two? I do not mean strict subset here. Yeah? It can be, I'm happy with if the answers are exactly the same. Yeah? Uh, well, there must be some restrictions on Q1 and Q2 in order that this holds, absolutely, something because happen, something, right? something will absolutely happen. And it, I mean, uh, formally, your question can be rephrased as, is this a non-trivial decision problem? Yeah, so that the answer is not always yes or not always no. And this is absolutely true. It's definitely a non-trivial decision problem. Mm. The reason why these type of problems are, uh, are believed to be uh, interesting is, um, is due to arguments for query optimization. Yeah? So suppose, I mean, what I'm telling now is very, very naive, and it, in real life it's probably incorrect, but I hope to give you an idea here. Yeah? So suppose that you have uh, um, a conjunctive regular path query, yeah? and you think, you look at it and you say, Hmm, this seems complicated to evaluate. Maybe, let's see if I can make this query simpler so that uh, uh, I don't have so much work evaluating it. So what could you do? Let's just remove one atom. Yeah? Now you have removed the restriction for that, that your query imposes. And your resulting query, it will always return at least the answers that your original query returned, but it may return more because you remove the restriction, right? So what can you do now? You test if um, your, wait, uh, so the new query will always return at least what the other one returned. So now you test containment in the correct direction to see if your new query does not return more than your old query, right? So the old query is, uh, uh, so the new one is still contained in the old one. And then you know that the old and the new query are equivalent. And now you have done some optimization, right? You have removed the restriction that you do not have to consider in your optimization. And, and yeah, and this is a reason why these types of problems are, are interesting, yeah? And in general, you can say, look, if you have a query and you want to optimize it, what you could do is you could you could apply some rewriting rules to your query, and then in the end, test if the resulting query is still equivalent to your original query, and if it is, fine. You evaluate the simpler one, right? And of course, equivalence of, of queries you can test with testing containment in both directions, right? So if you have an efficient algorithm for this, then you also have an efficient algorithm for, if for equivalence. Um, and actually, also, mm, yeah, so this is motivation. Mm, also, efficient or reasonably efficient, you can also understand this in this world a little bit differently. Yeah? Because remember that queries are not huge. Yeah? So if this problem, for example, is NB complete, or maybe even a bit worse, it's not a catastrophe. Yeah? Because your queries are small. So this is the motivation of this type of, uh, this type of questions, right? Query containment, um, I will skip uh, uh, conjunctive queries here because for what I am going to tell you, I do not need this material. I'm immediately starting with regular path queries. Mm, and this I will do tomorrow. Right, so the containment problem of regular path queries is complete for polynomial space. If you have uh, done some complexity on regular expressions and static analysis of regular expressions, this will not be surprising for you. And again, the reduction will be extremely short. Because why is this? Well, if you have two regular path queries, then what you basically need to decide is 
well, if these two are contained, if and only if the language of R1 is contained in the language of R2. And this is a problem that is <laughs> already very well known in formal language theory to be polynomial space complete, and this immediately gives you uh, uh, the result here. Yeah? Mm. And exactly the same proof will actually work for simple path and, 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 and trail semantics. Yeah? The thing is that this equivalence still holds under simple path and trail semantics. Good. All right, and I, if I recall correctly, you have been warned beforehand that this lecture would take until essentially 20 minutes past, and this is the moment we have more or less reached right now, and since the next block, I, will, I cannot do this block in two minutes, so we will do this one uh, tomorrow. So thank you very much that you were here, and thank you for the questions, and if you still want to ask me a couple of things after the lecture, go ahead, okay?